sing in some worship. Judgment. 
So I She told that only you can fill my mind knows that I can trust in you God you never fail and you never You're so good. You were so good. Here at your feet, I bow to it and in my heart again.
Thank you, church. You may be seated. We hear it in the voices of the hurting. We sense it in the brokenness of the world around us. Lostness is a blindness to the promise and hope of the gospel that leads to eternal separation from the Father. The world's greatest problem is lostness and it's growing every day. Eight billion people living in 195 countries, speaking over 7,000 languages. Today, more than half have yet to hear the good news of the gospel. The vision God gives us in Revelation 7-9, a multitude from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and languages, fuels our desire to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But we must be willing to go further than we've ever gone before. To the very edges of lostness, where more than 3,000 people groups have no missionary presence and likely no access to the gospel. No one is engaging them. Together, we can change that. We know the love and hope and peace of the gospel. 
We know the way, the truth, and the life. We know the power of true redemption. We will not ignore lostness. We will not be silent. We will not stand still. From the Great Commission until the Great Multitude, we must unite in this great pursuit to reach every nation, no matter the cost. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Allen. Um, December marks the time when we take a special offering. That's money set we set aside, different from our expenses here, to support spreading the gospel, telling everyone in the whole world how much Jesus loves them. If you listen to the statistics, there's at least 3,000 groups of people somewhere on this planet that haven't heard about Jesus. And Jesus God told us, Jesus told us, to go into all the world. That includes all the world. And so we are praying. There's prayer guides out in the lobby so for the lostness of the world. We're giving sacrificial offerings to help support and send the message and support missionaries. And so um, we'd ask you to do that. Prayerfully consider uh, certainly praying and as well as financially giving. And pray also, maybe from our midst, somebody that we know would accept the call, we call it a call, to actually go somewhere overseas, like my wife and I did once upon a time, and to tell people that don't know about Jesus, about Jesus. So, we call that the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and we pray that you would be involved in that this year. All right, moving on with our service. <coughs> Welcome, we're glad that you're here. If you're a first-time guest, uh, let me know, or join me at the... Uh, cafe, and we have a special gift to give you, just to say thank you for checking us out. Uh, we have a vision to be a church that the unchurched love to experience, so hopefully you feel comfortable inviting your unchurched people, folks, and if you're unchurched, we're hopefully you feel comfortable. And our mission statement is this, we are seeking to follow Jesus, changing together to be more like Christ. All right, today is a special day because we are, some of us anyway, are wearing special sweaters. So we're going to have a competition. So if you'd like to be involved in the competition, you need to come up here and st on the stage. I know some of you uh, young people want to do that, so come on up. First one up. Okay. <laughs> Adults are allowed. Come I on. Know, come on, guys. <laughs> if you know me, I love a good competition. So the more, the merrier. Dad, come up here. <laughs> Alan, you can join in too. You're wearing a Christmas sweater. Who else? Who else is coming up here? I think we have two competitions, right? We have one most creative and one the ugliest. Are you sure? <laughs> There might, be, there might be an ugly one up here. <laughs> okay, so let's start with most cre Actually, we'll talk about the prize, too. The winner gets their choice of a Smithsburg Valley T-shirt or hoodie. Can you open, open, hold that up for me, please, so everybody can see it? Wow, let's all clap at the prize. Beautiful. Very good. Okay, so I guess we'll start with most creative. And I will start on this end here. I'm going to hold my hand up against the contestant, and I want you guys to cheer if you think they deserve it. Ready? Oh. Oh, boy. All right, I think it's between you two come up here and dad, you come up here. All right, ready? Now, you know, this is for all the marbles people, so bring it. All right. 
notes. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> this is hard between these two. Okay, we'll do it one more time. Do you know? Yeah, I think we have two winners. You both win. You get to <laughs> pick a shirt or a hoodie at the front, okay? All right, who's competing in the ugliest? All right, if you're, well, we can't have another, you guys, you guys won, so you get your shirt and your hoodie. So let's bring in the line, <laughs> if we win two. Let's line up here, closer in. All right, this is really cute. I don't know if this classifies as ugly. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. <laughs> it's a little hippie Santa, it's cute. Turn around. Step back. <laughs> That's pretty ugly. Yeah. And you're so cute, too. All right. I don't think you guys are, you know, yeah. Okay. I think this, I think he's, Bentley's the winner <laughs> for ugliest. All right. Well, thank you guys for participating. You may take a seat now. doing uh, at Christmas this year is we call it Christmas Outreach. Um, in the lobby on the wall there is an opportunity to, for you to purchase a gift for some senior citizens and then there's a family that's had a fire on the other side there's a, a list of things you can possibly purchase for a family that's had a house fire. They have a, a daughter and a son on his way anytime and they just had a fire and lost everything so please consider uh, just take one of those things off the wall, purchase it, and bring it back by Christmas Eve, please. So don't forget to do that. Speaking of Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year, so we'll have our regular service on Sunday morning, and then from 6 to 7, uh, we'll have our evening service, uh, Christmas Eve service. Uh, usually we call it cocoa cookies and something else, carols. Um, but one thing, we always take... We have a, set up a picture booth, and we got a special backdrop this year. So even if you got a picture in past years, or maybe you can bring a family or friend that you hadn't got a picture with, we got a very special backdrop, so you want to be here. You can come early to get your picture taken, so come before 6. If your schedule is busy after 7, if you're busy before 6, then you can stay afterwards and get your picture taken. So hopefully see you all, plus uh, bring a friend. Uh, it's two, only two weeks away, folks. <laughs> two weeks away. Christmas, Christmas Eve. Um, if you're new to our church, uh, we'd like to give you a gift. And so to connect with you uh, at the uh, cafe after the service, please stop by there and um, get your gift. Okay, ways to give. We have offering plates in the back. You can also give on a website, app, and mail. And I think we crossed the mark of 50%. More than 50% of people now give electronically rather than these other means. It's pretty interesting. Somebody's been a pastor a long time. So, prayerfully consider giving to support the ministry here of our church. And we thank you for your generosity until now. So let's pray and we'll move on with our service. Ah, Father God, thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to celebrate some of these sweaters. Um, we thank you for the interest, uh, especially for the uh, young people in participating. Uh, God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for speaking to us through uh, the music, uh, through the offering, through the prayer, and also through the message. <clears throat> God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. started a series. We use, I usually talk about a topic for a couple weeks. So we started a new series last week called Missing Peace. The angel came to the shepherd and said, peace on earth. Doesn't seem to be a lot of peace on earth, right? There's a lot of missing peace. So we talked about there's peace with God, there's peace with uh, 
people, there's peace with yourself, there's people with uh, peace with your circumstances. Well, today we're going to dwell in, dr uh, drill down on, or dwell on peace with other people. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like this. Help. People are driving me crazy. In fact, on your outline, I put a question at the beginning. Don't raise your hand. Certainly don't point to the person sitting next to you. <laughs> Do you know someone that's difficult to love? And I'm sure we all have someone in our life like that. Uh, I think God kind of designs it that way to see how we, we will respond. Um, things have been going downhill for a while, especially since COVID, in people's uh, ability to get along, if you will. Experts tell us it's going to take decades, 10 or 20 years, for us to figure out what has been the effect of COVID to in our relationships, in, in our culture, uh, financially, etc. Used to be that uh, you try, if you wanted to not have an argument with somebody, if you wanted to get along with somebody, especially somebody new, there was two topics you didn't, pick, didn't talk about, politics and religion. If you avoided those, you pretty much could talk to anybody about anything. But especially since COVID, you can't practically talk about anything. But somebody else has got some strong opinion on almost every topic, whether it's to get vaccinated or not, to who knows where. Um, so you can't talk about anything. Somebody is almost always going to be offended. <clears throat> so put on your outline. If you're continually, a continual search to be offended, you always find what you're looking for. The sad thing about this is, in that situation, there's no winners. I've never had anybody come to tell me, tell me oh, my life is so much better since somebody ticked me off since I was offended by somebody. So you're not better off. The person that you feel likes offended you is not better off. So here's the bottom line. Being offended is inevitable. Some of you just took the membership class. I mentioned in there. If you're here very long, somebody's going to do something to offend you. That's just life, right? So I suggest to you in the membership class, decide what you're going to do <laughs> when that happens. And hopefully you've, you've decided to do this. Living offended is a choice, all right? How you respond to that offense is a choice that you and, and I make all the time. Hopefully good choices. <clears throat> so, last week, sum up what we talked about last week, we said peace isn't found in the absence of problems. Otherwise, nobody would ever have peace. We all have problems, right? Nobody's got a perfect life. So, when we talk about peace, it's possible in the midst of problems. In fact, Jesus told us we'd have lots of problems, and He also said we could have peace. So, true peace, we called it perfect peace or shalom, shalom last week, is found in the presence of God. So in the presence of God, I can have peace no matter what's going on over here. Is it automatic? Is it easy? No. But that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So we're going to look at something, a couple things that Paul wrote. Mostly we're going to look at chapter 12 of a book called Romans. <clears throat> and we're going to start in the middle and then we're going to go back to the beginning of the chapter. Bless those who persecute you. Uh, offend you, uh, people that make your life miserable. Paul said we are to bless them. Bless and do not curse them. Bless and do not retaliate against them. Bless and do not try and get even with them. So what does it mean to bless? It's a word we kind of throw out. What does it mean to bless? <clears throat> so I put it on your outline. The actual Greek word means good word, all right? So I just described it this way, to speak well of or wish the best for someone. That's what it means to, be, to bless. So those people that are making you miserable, people that are offending you, you are, you know, I are to speak well or wish the best for them. Now, that's not easy to do, is it? Now, it's easy for us to be nice to people that are nice to us, right? Most of you are nice to me. It's easy for me to be nice to you. Um, a little bit different when we talk about people that are nasty, people that are mean, people that are hurting us, people are doing stuff that, you know, we don't approve of. But the kind of sick thing that I have in me and maybe you have in you too is I'm kind of glad when they get their come comeuppance. And let me prove it to you. Somebody goes by you at 90 miles an hour 
Five miles down the road, the cop has pulled him over and they're getting a speeding ticket. How do you feel? Happy, right? And they just got a speeding ticket. Their unpleasant circumstance made us happy. And that's just one example. Um, hopefully it doesn't last. <laughs> uh, I understand. We, 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 they're driving crazy and it's unsafe and it's, we're glad that they got stopped, right? But sometimes we rejoice when those mean people get their come up comeuppance, don't we? But no, we're not supposed to. <laughs> we're supposed to bless them. We're supposed to wish the best for them. We are to pray for them. <clears throat> Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount, something that's very difficult for us. He's talking about in the law, the Old Testament, um, the, the teaching was an eye for an eye. So if you put out my eye, I get to put out your eye. I don't know how much good that does, but it's, you know, try and keep things even. But he said, okay, I got a better idea, better plan. Do not resist an evil person or try to get e even with an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, what do you want I want to do? Slap them back, right? That's an eye for an eye. No, he said, no, 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 there's something better. Offer the other cheek also. Now, I'm sorry you hit me. I wish you hadn't, but if you need to, hit me again. How many of us do that? Not, not too many, right? What he's saying is you give up your rights. You give up your right to not be slapped, or you get your, give up your right to slap back when you get slapped. I heard someone say, well, I'll give them the second cheek, but they hit me again, that's it. No, 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 there's not a second cheek and limit. In fact, Jesus said to forgive how many times? It was unlimited. So back to that, <coughs> uh, that verse about bless those who persecute you. Literally, it's in a present continuous sense in the Greek. You can't see that in English. So here's literally what that verse says. Be a continual blessing now and next minute and the next hour, the next day, next week. Be a continual blessing to those who are not just a one-time offender, but a continual problem. They continue have issues with you. You have issues with them. They continue to make your life miserable. Continue to bless them who continually cause us problems. Now notice, this is a command. If you're not a Jesus follower, you can ignore it. And if you're not, we're glad that you're here. I think there's a lot of good advice here. But this is a command. So if you're a Jesus follower, you and I don't have an option. Say, yeah, I'll do that sometimes, or maybe I'll do it, I'll try and do it. No, no, no. <laughs> Jesus said, this is your marching order, part of your marching order. This is what you and I are supposed to do 24-7. Continually bless those who are continual problems. See, I can do it for short term, right? Oh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have retaliated. I shouldn't have, you know, spoken, said something nasty back. Forgive me. I'll, I'll pray for that person. But later on, I'm thinking about it. What happens? I'm not blessing them anymore. I'm hoping you get, again, so, somehow they get, get even with them. But no, no, no. Continual blessing, even if they're continually causing us problems. So I put a simple question next. How can you and I do that? That's hard. It's not natural, is it? So Paul's going to give us some advice, give us some suggestions, some insight into how you and I can do what God has commanded us to do. So back at the beginning of chapter 12 of, of Romans, here's what Paul said. He's already written what we call 11 chapters, <clears throat> a lot of good stuff in there. And then chapter 12, he says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, so he's writing again to believers, not people that aren't believers, in view of God's mercy. So here's the perspective, okay? Keep in mind God's mercy, and we could say grace, God's love, all those things. How God has treated you, and what has God done? While we were yet sinners, we had no interest in, in God, He sent His Son Jesus to suffer and die for us, for me. So with that in mind, offer your bodies, offer your life, as a living sacrifice. doesn't necessarily want us to die physically, but He wants us to offer our lives as a sacrifice. That means give up our lives. Give up our selfishness. Lay down our selfishness. Putting ourselves first. This is holy and pleasing to God. So, want to please God? It's one way you and I can do it. 
by giving up our selfish nature. This is your true and proper worship. I put on your outline, we usually think of this as worship, what we do here on Sunday morning, right? Especially the singing part. Worshiping God isn't just songs that we sing. He's saying it's a life you live 24-7. We worship God by the way we live our lives. <clears throat> now, thinking about Jesus, uh, this is John chapter 10. He's talking about, he uses this analogy that I'm the good shepherd, and like any good shepherd, I take care of my sheep. And then he says, at one point, the shepherd's willing to die for his sheep. Right? He's attacked by a lion or something. He's willing to put his life at risk. So then he's talking about himself. He says this, no one can take my life from me. Now, we often say that Jesus was executed. The Romans arrested him, tried him, tortured him, executed him, which was technically true. But he's also true that no one could take his life from me. He said, I sacrifice it voluntarily. So Jesus volunteered to die on the cross. There's a song that says he could have called 10,000 angels down to wipe out everybody. He didn't have to die on that cross. He had the power not to. So he voluntarily sacrificed his life, literally. So he's saying, you and I are supposed to voluntarily sacrifice our lives, lay it down, lay it down our uh selfishness, because he had the authority to do what, he, uh, lay it down when I, and also to take it up again. He had the power. He was God. Again, he could have called all the angels he needed. So this was, he gave up his life. The Romans didn't take it from him. For this is what my father has commanded. So he always listened to his father. His father said, okay, uh, I need you to die for the, so that all mankind can have a, a a saving relationship with me and spend eternity with me in heaven. So that's, that's what I want you to do. And so he said, okay, that's what I do. But I do it voluntarily. So then back to, to Romans chapter 12. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Don't like, like other people. <clears throat> and here he says, but let God transform you or change you, make you something different. He describes as a new person. How does that happen? By changing the way you think. We talked about that a little bit last week. It all starts up here, right? We have feelings, but we can override our feelings by our minds. So, it's going to change our way of thinking from getting even or things being even or getting up, one up on somebody else. But no, <laughs> I'm going to sacrifice my life. I'm going to give up my selfishness. I'm going to bless people that harm me or persecute me. The next part is really interesting because then he says you will know God's will for you. You ever have difficulty figuring out what God wants you to do? I think sometimes it's because we are living selfishly, right? Once we give up whatever we want, then it's a little easier to figure out what God wants. And then he says, what, what about God's will? God's will is good and pleasing and perfect. So why would I want something else that is not good, not pleasing, and certainly imperfect? So again, how do we do this? Or how do we love unlovable people? How do we do it? Well, in another place, Romans, uh, other than Romans, Paul's discussing the same topic, and he says it this way in, in Galatians. My old self, it was before I became a Jesus follower, has been crucified with Christ. So that, that life of mine is now dead, right? Uh, he talks about being born again. So then we got it born into a new life. He says, it is no longer I who live. So that person that was living <laughs> before Christ is gone. But how am I living now? See, the focus here is on life, not death. But Christ lives in me. So I live this in this earthly body. How do we live Christ in me? By trusting okay, the Son of God. Why can I trust Him? Because He loved me He gave Himself for me. So I trust Him more than I can trust anybody else, right? So we have resurrection power available to us. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, which means power. 
So that's the way we can do this. I can't do it. In fact, I need to get rid of that old life, that old way of thinking. Let Christ take control. Let Him think His thoughts, as we talked about last week. Think what would Jesus think, what would He think, sacrifice, be transformed. I can love the unloving. Not in this natural, but in my spiritual nature, godly nature, I can. So back to where we started off in Romans. After he said, bless those who persecute you, he said, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Can you be happy for other people's happiness? Hopefully you can. Sometimes we're jealous of it. We shouldn't be. We certainly should weep with those who weep. Come alongside when people are struggling, when they had heartache and sickness and death. Uh, help bear one another's burdens. It's a little easier when somebody helps, comes alongside you and, and sympathizes, maybe even empathizes with you. Then he goes on, live in harmony with each other. Now, you musical folks understand harmony better than I do, but I can, un I can hear when people aren't singing in harmony. <laughs> and that's not what you want to hear, is it? Right? You want to hear people sing in harmony, and the singing is even better when there's harmony, right? So he said, we're supposed to live in harmony with each other. Life is better when we're in harmony. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Uh, we don't have a lot of caste system, but, you know, uh, are you uncomfortable being with poor people or maybe uh, the elderly or maybe uh, street people? He says, don't be. And don't think you know it all. So that Greek word, don't be too proud, you know what it, what it means? Don't be too proud. <laughs> that's what it literally means. We might call it conceited. Don't be conceited. And that's what, think you know it all. Do you, who likes to be around a know-it-all? I didn't think so. Nobody, nobody wants to be around to know it all. I mean, reality is nobody knows it all. So it's just frustrating to deal with somebody that, and that's what's kind of happened to, from COVID, right? Everybody seems to think they know it all, um, but nobody knows it all. So how do we deal with that? Let me give you some suggestions. Jesus didn't tell us to be right. He wants us to be right, but he didn't tell us most important things to be right. Bible says this, Bible said that. He told us what? They will know that we're Jesus followers by what? Not that we get our theology right, but by loving one another. And so, we have all this division in politics and, and culture, society, whether it's because of one side or, or the other. Maybe it's because of some religious difference. Maybe it's some uh, view of sexuality difference, whatever it might be. Most important is not getting that right. We should get it right. We should strive to get it right. But to be, first and foremost, loving. Uh, one of my biggest regrets in my ministry, it's been a long time, is what I, when I started out, I was what you would call a legalist. I saw the Bible as black and white, and no gray area. And, I, and if I could find it in the Bible, I knew I was right. And so wherever you were, you were wrong. And that's one of the biggest regrets. Because I put that, my interpretation, because sometimes I'm, <laughs> it turned out to be wrong, it will priority over the person. And we always get in trouble and we always have regrets when we do that. So, here's a suggestion. When people talk, don't listen to respond. I do that all the time, right? I want to come back. I'm one of these devil advocates, drives my wife crazy. Pray for my wife, by the way. She's pretty sick right now. Um, yeah, okay, I, I, I find something's not true in what you're saying, and I, I want to come back, come back at you. Um, don't, don't talk, to, uh, listen to people to respond, to correct them. Listen to understand and to love them, all right? That's what I'm listening for. Okay, everybody believes what they believe for a good reason, pretty much for a good reason. And so, you know, I... I, I see that differently, but please tell me, why do you feel that way? Why do you think that way? I still might not agree with you, but at least I can have a dialogue with you. I can have a relationship with you, and may, hopefully you'll listen to me, right? I put on your outline. If you can't understand another's perspective, 
And that's what I see so much in our culture now. Your impact is always going to be limited. In fact, there's no connection. He's dug in over here, they're dug in over there, nothing gets done. And for most of us, that's a big frustration we have, like with our political system, right? Things can't get done. People are too polarized. Uh, I've said this many times. Uh, hurt people hurt people. And this is the easiest way for me to deal with somebody that may be mean, unkind, even hurting me. Well, why are you act? I mean, I don't ask them the question, but in my mind I'm saying, okay, something must be off in their lives. Something must be, you know, difficult for them to deal with. Maybe I can, I certainly can pray for them. Maybe there's some way I can help them so they won't be hurting so much. Because we're all there sometimes, right? We're all hurting people sometimes. Back to our text. <clears throat> Actually, this is another place <laughs> Paul wrote. There's a lot of these overlapping things that Paul wrote. This was to the church in Ephesus. Always be humble and gentle. Humble means I don't always know, think I know what's always right. Well, I'm not sure, okay? I can learn something. Be gentle, not harsh. Be patient with each other. And make allowances for each other's faults. We all have faults, right? So if you're in fault right now, that's okay. Uh, next, you know, next time I might be at fault. Why would you, we do make allowances for that? Because of our love. See, folks, you and I that are Jesus followers, we have this amazing, tremendous privilege to represent Christ here on earth. Right? And people are watching us. I'll give you a, a story from it happened in our life this week. We have a new lady move into our care home, and uh, we call her Miss Kim. Uh, she's a Buddhist, so you pray for her. Um, but this, she moved in Wednesday. My wife had to take her to a doctor's appointment. I think it was on Friday. And Miss Kim wanted her to run some errands for her. And my wife said, no, you've got to talk to the caseworker. And the caseworker told her no. So my wife didn't get in trouble, but she did. But this lady, Miss Kim, said to my wife, I thought you Christian. She doesn't talk real good English. I thought you Christian. We've known her for three days. Well, she visited before that. She's been watching. She even talked to me on Wednesday. Said, you're, you're, you're a pastor. You're a minister. I said, yeah, I'd like to talk to you sometime about your, your faith. And she was excited about that. So I'm looking forward to that. But people are watching. So we had this tremendous privilege to represent Christ, but also the big responsibility, right? It says make allowances for other people. We want other people to make allowances for us, right? When we mess up, do something stupid, yeah, well, sorry about that. Please forgive me, and we hope people do. I got to thinking about Jesus and this patient thing. There's so many illustrations for the. thought about the time he healed 10 lepers. He healed 10, ten guys of leper. Leprosy was a death sentence, right? He healed 10 of them. One came back to thank him. Now, if, you're, if I'm Jesus, I'm saying, okay, I healed 10 guys. One came back. Next time, I'm only going to figure out which one is thankful, and I'll heal him. No, no, Jesus didn't do that. Doubting Thomas, he wasn't there when Jesus showed up the first time with the disciples. And we call him Doubting Thomas because he doubted Jesus was resurrected because he hadn't seen him. Of course, the other disciples had already seen him. So when he shows up, Jesus doesn't say, why didn't you believe in me? He said, okay, you want to see? Here, look at my hand. Put your hand in there, in the wound if you need to. Patience. Gentle. Humble. Then he goes on, next verse, he says, make every effort to keep yourself united, there's that harmony word, in the spirit. We're all different, we're all going to have different opinions, but we can be united. Holy Spirit in you should unite with the Holy Spirit in me. Binding yourselves, that's how it says. Binding yourselves together, and there's our word, peace. Difference of opinions, that's okay. We can still have harmony still have unity, we can have peace. Here's what I want you to think about. Your life is too short, folks. Some of you are a lot younger than me. <laughs> Some of us are getting at the tail end of that thing called life. But life is too short, and you're calling too great, that calling to represent Christ well, to be offended by something small. 
It made me think of that, uh, don't sweat the small stuff. And what's the next line? Everything is small stuff. You might feel greatly offended, but it's still small stuff. So back to Romans chapter 14. We've almost finished. A person with discretion is not easily angered. He gains res- Oh, this is a Proverbs. Forgot. He gains respect. How? How do you gain respect? By overlooking an offense, not letting it bother you, not feeling offended, not reciprocating, not retaliating. Just decide to let it go. Most of you know my wife. I don't know anybody else who this, does this better than her. The reason I know that because she's put up with me for 47 years. <laughs> and your spouse has done the same thing for you, I'm sure. <clears throat> this is something she says to me. Well, you say it more often because we would argue more often. Love doesn't seek to win the argument. I'm a competitive person, Claudia, <laughs> a competitive person. I want to win the argument. And it's so stupid, especially when it's with your spouse, because if I win, that means she does what? She loses. Do I want my wife to lose? No, I don't. She always says it this way. We're on the same team. All right? Now, we have constructive discussions, let me tell you. Uh, we don't agree on everything. But in the long run, Relationships more important than the argument. We have a great relationship. So, back to Romans now. Never pay back evil with more evil. Don't even think about it. Just don't ever do it. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable, above reproach. And then probably the the verse that we're most familiar with and probably one we need to remember the most, (laughs) verse 18. Do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. Do all that you can. The things you can control. You can't control the other person, but everything you can control. You can control your heart, your attitude, your actions. I put it this way on your outline. It takes two to reconcile, but it takes one to forgive. Whether you forgive me or not, doesn't matter. I can forgive you. It takes two to reconcile, but it only takes one to be loving. So I can love you even if you don't love me. You and I can do that, whether it's in a disrupted rela- a marriage relationship, parent-child relationship, uh, siblings. I have two siblings that don't talk to me. I've done everything I can up to this point. If something new comes up, I'll try that. Again, your life is too short, and your calling to represent Christ well is too great to be offended by small stuff. Another translation of that verse says, as far as it depends on you, Again, whatever's in your control, you control that. Being offended is inevitable. Living offended is a choice. And I choose Jesus. When I choose Jesus, I choose peace. So, simple assignment. Do you have a disrupted relationship? If so, do all you can to live in peace with that person. Let me pray with you. Uh, Father God, thank you that we can have peace with you first and foremost because of what your son Jesus did for us. <laughs> this tremendous act of, of love and grace and mercy. While we were yet sinners, you died for us. We thank you for that. And we pray to anyone here or w- anybody watching who's never accepted that gift because it's a free gift. You did it freely for us. You chose to. We pray today would be the day you would accept that gift realizing that you are separating from God by your sin and that God will forgive you in Jesus. No matter whether we're believers or not, God, we struggle with relationships. No one's perfect, and so we butt heads sometimes, and sometimes pe- people are nasty and mean and unkind to us. And we wanna, don't want to re- respond in kind. We want to re- overlook it. To love them as you love us. God, that's hard sometimes. To love them loving and continuing to do that. So we pray for your strength and your power. And I pray for those disruptive relationships. Those that are hearing this would take the first step. If that per- other person's not uh, had the benefit of this teaching. And God, just give us opportunities 
to represent you well. Not so we look good, so that you look good for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We all have this rough relationship. If you have one that we can help with, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pastor Allen. Let's stand together and sing one more song. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you next time.